Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. In just a few moments, we're going to read uh, uh, the opening verses of Matthew chapter 6 and uh, see what God has to say for us today. So let me ask you, how many of you ever heard someone say this? Hopefully you've never said this, but you've heard someone say this. You know what? They've said, I'd go to church if there weren't so many hypocrites there. Did you ever hear anybody say that? I mean, using that as an excuse, you know, I go to church, but church is just filled with hypocrites. So why am I going to go hang around hypocrites? Uh, a few weeks ago, I was up in uh, one of our Bible classes, and uh, I do that occasionally so the kids can ask questions. And the very first question in one of the Bible classes I got was this girl raised her hand, and her question very simply was this, Pastor Brian, how come there are so many hypocrites in church? I had to make sure she wasn't talking about me. I said, is that, a, is that a personal reference or what is it? The simple truth is this, that the church, our church, is filled with imperfect people. The church is filled with imperfect people. All of us are under construction. I could wear a great big sign on myself today that simply said this, under construction. Because God is still at work on me. Is God still at work on you? I trust he is, and I trust that you are under construction as well. All of us are in need of God's grace. All of us are in need of God's forgiveness. Being imperfect, though, makes us human. Being imperfect does not necessarily make us a hypocrite. And sometimes I think the outside world looks at our imperfections, and because they see our imperfections, they, uh, they confuse imperfection with hypocrisy. I would say that Jesus' view of hypocrisy is different than ours. Jesus' view of hypocrisy is different from many people who were outside the church. That's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6, the chapter that we begin reading this week. And so I want to begin just with one verse, and we'll dig into the other uh, four verses in just a few moments. But notice Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Notice what Jesus says. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Now, he's not saying beware of being righteous. That's not what he's saying. He says beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. So here Jesus is talking about individuals who practice righteousness, do religious things, but they do them for the motive of what? Being observed by others, Uh, other people recognizing what they do. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Jesus says, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Boy, that's a strong verse. Jesus says, "Don't, don't practice righteousness in order to be recognized for others because if you're recognized by others, you won't receive a reward in heaven. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And man, we readily admit that there are passages of scripture that are difficult for us to digest. Verses that maybe might not be difficult for us to comprehend, but verses that are difficult for us to apply to our lives. And Lord, these might be verses that, that kind of hit us right between the eyes or give us a little bit of a, uh, of a spiritual gut check and Lord, I pray that you'd help us today to be sensitive and, Lord, not only listen to the explanation of the passage, but even more importantly, help us to listen to the Holy Spirit as he applies the passage to our lives. Help us to be sincere. Help us to be real. Lord, help us to be transparent in the way that we live. And God, I pray that you would mold us and shape us into who you would have us to be. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, after five months, we've made it through Matthew chapter five. Did you ever think we were ever gonna get through that chapter? Uh, Taking us five months to get through Matthew chapter five, but we have made it. Jesus' teaching, though, has been clear, very clear, 
And it's been convicting. I trust it's been convicting to you because it has been convicting to me. The gist of Jesus' message that he said so far in, in this, the Sermon on the Mount, is this. You and I can never be good enough. Uh, we can try to be as righteous. We can try to be as religious. We can try to do as many good things as we possibly can. But religion, goodness, our own self-righteousness is not good enough. Rules will not save us. Religion will not change us. Here's the message that Jesus is saying. We desperately need him. We desperately need Jesus. There's no way that we can apply the Beatitudes. There's no way that we can have strong marriages. There's no way that we can get along with our enemies. There's no way that we can respond correctly when people offend us. If Jesus isn't in our lives, and if we're not allowing him to live through us, that's the message in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 6, Jesus introduces a, a new thought, or at least Jesus introduces a new word. The word hypocrite is found for the first time in Matthew chapter 6, and it's found three times in this chapter. It's found in, in verse 2. Notice, uh, we'll jump along in just a few moments, but Jesus said, Thus when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. In verse 9, if you jump down to verse 9, Jesus says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And in verse 16, Jesus says, When you fast, do not look gloomy, like the hypocrites do. In other words, here's what Jesus is warning us. He warns his listeners, and he warns us. Here's what he says. Beware of hypocrisy. If you're following along in the outline, that's the very first thing that I wrote. Very simply this, beware of hypocrisy. The word be beware has the idea of being on guard. It has the idea of being on the lookout. It has the idea of not allowing the, the wrong way of thinking or the wrong way of acting to take hold of you. So here's what Jesus says, beware. Now, now we ask ourselves, what then should we be wary of? I found it interesting that, that the warning is not to beware of dangerous people. Jesus could have very honestly said, beware of thieves and robbers. He could have honestly said, beware of murderers, beware of bad people. But that's not what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, we are not warned to guard against something external, but the warning that Jesus gives us is internal. He's not warning us against something that can, can affect us on the outside of our bodies, but rather he's warning us about something that happens on the inside of us, something that affects our hearts. So Jesus says, beware of hypocrisy. A hypocrite, we, we think we understand the term today, but in New Testament times, a hypocrite was originally a Greek actor, a Greek actor who wore a mask that, that portrayed in an exaggerated way the role that was being dramatized. As a matter of fact, actors were previously known as hypocrites. Why? Because they were portraying a role that was not themselves. They were pretending to be something other than themselves. Even today, the symbol that is used for drama is two masks. You've seen them, one representing comedy and the other representing tragedy. So, so technically speaking, a hypocrite is a person who pretends to be something that they're not. Well, here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus takes that word, and he uses it not speaking of actors, He's not speaking of drama. He's not speaking about, you know, the, the popular television shows that existed when he was alive back then, all right? He's not speaking of any of that. He takes that, that secular term, and Jesus uses it in a spiritual sense. He takes that word that was understood to the culture of his day, and he gives it a spiritual meaning. 
So when Jesus says, beware of hypocrisy, don't be like the hypocrites, here's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying this, hypocrisy is the insincere performance of a religious act in order to impress others. Let me say that again, Brian's definition, all right? Hypocrisy is the insincere performance of a religious act in order to impress others. Now, you know as well as I do, the Bible is filled with hypocrites. Uh, We could talk about hypocrites in the Bible. The very first was Cain. You, You remember the story of Cain and Abel? Cain feigned worship to God by offering to God a sacrifice that God did not want. God had already laid out, and then here's what I want you to give for me as a sacrifice. And Cain was like, hey, I don't want to give what you want. I want to give what I want. And, and he took what he wanted to give to God, and he said, God, here is worship. I'm worshiping you. And God says, that's not what I want. That's not what I asked for. And then Cain had the audacity of what? Of getting mad because God would not accept his worship. Man, quite frankly, we could park there for a while because I'm afraid at times we do the exact same thing. We offer to God something that God has not asked for, and then when our worship, our definition of worship does not match his, if we're not careful, we have a tendency to get upset at God. Cain was the very first hypocrite. Another example is Judas Iscariot. Think with me, Judas Judas walked with Jesus and the other disciples for three and a half years. Why? He acted like one of them. So much so that, that the other 11 disciples were absolutely convinced as to his sincerity. Judas talked like a Christian. He publicly acted like a Christian. But we know the rest of the story, right? Judas's devotion was what? It was artificial. Judas was not sincere. And when the moment came, he what? He betrayed the Lord. The Bible is filled with hypocrites. But let me pause for a second and say this. It's easy for us to do the exact same thing. It's easy for us to perform a religious act, to do something that God wants us to do, and yet do it with insincerity, to do it with the wrong motives. I can stand up and I can sing, not necessarily I, but somebody could stand up and sing and and sing in a beautiful voice and act like they're praising God, but on the inside, their motive isn't to praise God, their motive is what? To be praised by men. And they stand up and they want to use their gift, but they want people to recognize how good they are. Hypocrisy. We can work in the children's ministry or any other ministry for the purpose of pleasing the pastor or pleasing someone else. And by the way, I want you to work in the children's ministry, and I want you to work in there. And yes, it will please me if you do that, all right? But that cannot be our motive. Because if our motive is to please anyone other than God, we're insincere in what we're doing. We can serve the Lord in the food pantry for the purpose of getting free food. (laughs) Or, Or we can serve in any capacity with the wrong motive. We can give to others. We can give to God with a motivation, okay, if I give this, then, then I'm hoping God will give something back to me. And we almost treat God with this quid pro quo. You know, you, you know, I'll scratch your back, God, you scratch my back. I'm gonna give to you, but God, here's what I expect back from you. What is that? It's insincerity. It's hypocrisy. All of those are good religious acts, but if we're not careful, they can be done with the wrong motives. Here's what the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 16 too. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Do you see that? People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. 
You see, God not only sees what we do, but God is able to see why we do it. You and I don't have that x-ray vision. We can't see that. We just see what a person is doing externally. We can't read their heart. We can't detect their heart, but God can detect our hearts. And God not only sees what we're doing externally, but God sees the condition of the hearts. Remember when Israel was looking for a king, God says this. He said, man looks on the outward appearance, you know the verse, but God looks where? God looks on the hearts. And God sees the heart of the matter. This morning as I stand before you, God sees my hearts. And today, as you're here worshiping God, God sees your heart. And God knows why you're here this morning. If you came with a a sincere heart to seek Him and to worship Him, or if you were had your arm twisted this morning and you don't want to be here, God knows your hearts. And God judges our motive. Hey, listen, here's the next thing I wrote in my notes. Motives matter to God. That's so very important. As a matter of fact, would you repeat that back with me? That's deep stuff. Motives matter to God. God not only only sees the external of what we're doing, but God sees our motives. So the challenge is to make sure that you and I are serving the Lord for the proper reasons. Listen, if we're honest, we all struggle with this. Let, Let me be transparent with you this morning. I struggle with this. You said, Brian, you're our pastor. You're not supposed to struggle with anything. I struggle with a lot of things. Isn't that right, Vicki? <laughs> don't throw me under the bus, Vic. I'm telling you, don't throw me under the bus. I'm a people pleaser. That's who I am. I want people to like my messages. I really want that. I want the people in the congregation to think, boy, that Brian's a fantastic pastor. Uh, uh, I love compliments. Listen, uh, no ulterior motive. I'm not saying that so you say anything this morning. I'm just sharing my heart. That's what, that's what I want. That, uh, that's what my flesh wants. I love praise. I love that. Listen, though, if that is what motivates me to do what I do, guess what Brian is? I'm a hypocrite. So I have to get before God every Sunday morning and say, God, examine my motives today. God, examine my heart. God, today I want to preach for an audience of one. And I desire for one person to be pleased with what I say. And I want that one person to be you. You see, on a regular basis, We should ask God to examine our hearts. We should ask God to examine our motives. And we should make sure that we are serving for the right reasons. Jesus says, beware of hypocrisy. Guard your hearts. Be on the lookout. Look inside your heart internally. Don't let your heart deceive you. Because if you're doing a religious action with the wrong motive, God sees it. God notices it. And guess what? You've already gotten your reward, and you will not be rewarded in heaven. Beware of hypocrisy. Jesus then speaks of the first area in which it's easy for us to be hypocritical. In the next few weeks, we're going to be walking through the verses because Jesus talks about giving Jesus talks about praying, and then Jesus talks about fasting. Uh, Read with me the rest of the verses today in our passage, chapter 6 and verse 2. He already said, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen of them. Verse 2, thus, so he's continuing the thought, thus, when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have already received their reward. But when you give to the needy, 
Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then Jesus says, and your father, who guess what? Sees in secrets will reward you. The word that Jesus uses for giving depending upon the translation that you have, can be translated alms. Uh, In some translations, it's translated charity. It's a word that literally refers to any act of mercy or pity. Biblically, the word came to mean the giving of money, the giving of food, the giving of clothing to the poor. Notice, it's really interesting what Jesus says. And remember, we believe that every word of the Bible is inspired, right? Not just the nouns and the verbs, but every word. Notice what Jesus says. He says, when you give and not if you give. So Jesus doesn't say thus, if you give. If you take what I've given it to you and you give it to help others. That's not the word he uses. He says, when you do this. In other words, what is he saying? Jesus is saying, using our resources to help others, using our resources to support the Lord's work is something that should be the natural response of every believer. Boy, boy, that's so important for us to understand because many times I've illustrated this before. We receive so many blessings from God. Let me just ask this morning, how many of you have been blessed by God this week? All right, all of us have. We just had a team return from Haiti, and n- next week they're going to be giving their report. If you've never been to Haiti, you need to be to Haiti just to minister to the Haitian people, but you need to go to Haiti because it's going to change your perspective on life. Because the very poorest of us here this morning are extremely wealthy compared to standards around the world. All of us have been blessed by God. And yet if we're not careful, this is the way we take God's blessings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we we fill our pockets with what God gives us. And we fail to realize that God gives us what he gives us, not so that we can hoard. And by the way, that's a word that's used in, in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll see it later on. Not so that we can hoard our resources, but so that we can be a channel of blessing to others. So God gives to us so that we might give to others. In these verses, Jesus teaches several important truths about how his followers should give and why his followers should give. So notice three things. I wrote down three things in our notes today. Really simple, nothing profound. But the first is this. You and I should give sincerely. We should give sincerely. That's the main point that Jesus is making. He's saying, listen, don't don't sound a trumpet before you. Don't let everybody know. Don't give for the wrong reasons. Don't give so that you will be recognized by others. Your giving should be sincere. Your giving should be honest. Your giving should be transparent. You and I should give for the right reasons reasons. Let me show you an example of somebody in the New Testament who gave, someone who gave generously, but they gave for the wrong reason. And let's notice how God responded to them. Put your finger here. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. If you have your your phone or or, or iPad, turn back to Acts chapter 4. Because in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, we see the story of someone who gave, someone who gave generously, but they gave for the wrong reason reason. And you'll be surprised how God responded. We'll start in verse 36 so we understand the context. Verse 36 says this, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. You're familiar with Barnabas. He went on on one of Paul's missionary journeys. A Levite, a native of Cyprus, verse 37 says this, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So let me me pause for a second. So here's here's Barnabas, who, who owns this piece of property. Who knows whether it was an inheritance or whatever. He owns this piece of property. He sells the property, and he takes all of the proceeds 
proceeds from the property, and he what? And he lays it at the apostles' feet, and he says, listen, I want you to use this for the Lord's work. I want you to use this for feeding the poor, whatever. And so he takes all of the proceeds and gives it to God. Obviously commendable for doing that. Remember, we get to chapter 5. The chapter divisions were placed later. The story continues from chapter 4 to chapter 5. And so we just saw what Barnabas did, but the next verse, chapter 5, verse 1 says, But a man named Ananias with his wife sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but you have lied to God. So, so here's what's taking place. Evidently, Ananias and Sapphira were impressed with the response that Barnabas received for having given all of that money to the Lord. So Ananias looks at his wife and says, hey, we got a piece of property. Why don't we sell the piece of property we have? But here's what we'll do. We won't take all of the money. We'll take a portion of the money, but we'll act like we're going to give all of the money. So we're going to sell it for $1,000, but we're going to take $500 and lay it at the apostles' feet as if we were giving the full amount back to God. You, you see, I want you to catch the, the, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was not that they didn't give God the full amount. Because in, in, in verse 4, Peter says this, listen, the property was yours. You could have done with it what you wanted. The proceeds of the property were yours. You could have done what you wanted. Then he makes this statement. Why then did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you pretend like you were giving a certain percentage of the proceeds when you weren't giving the full amount? You see, here's what was taking place in Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted the recognition but they didn't want to make the sacrifice. They wanted to be received like Barnabas was received, but they didn't want to make the sacrifice that Barnabas made. Their desire to impress others, here's what I wrote in my notes, their desire to impress others caused them to be dishonest with God. You say, Brian, how do you know they were being dishonest with God? Because notice P Peter's response in verse 4. You have not lied to man, he says, but you have lied to God. Notice God's quick response. Notice, notice verse, um, verse 5. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He died. He lied died. He lied to the apostles. He lied to God. And at that moment, boom, God killed him. Verse 7, the story continues. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for this much. So Sapphira, how much did you guys sell the land for? Did you sell it for $500? Yes, Peter, we sold it for $500. And we have given all of the proceeds to God. Just interjecting a little bit of uh, Brian's translation in there. Verse 9, but Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? I love, I love the faith of Peter. He says, the guys that picked up your husband and carried his dead body out are at the door, and guess what? They're carrying you out in just a few moments. And she what? She fell down dead. Not, not. And by the way, the Bible says two times in this passage that great fear fell on the entire church. Could you imagine if all of a sudden God showed up at Hollywood Community Church in such a way that if somebody was worshiping hypocritically, that God killed them during the service? What do you think would happen at Hollywood Community Church? Either empty the building or revival would take place, right? 
One of, one of the two things would happen. God did not take their sin lightly. What was their sin? It was not, don't misinterpret it, it was not that they didn't give God all of it. It was that they were hypocritical in what they gave. They feigned, they pretended like they were giving a certain amount when they weren't giving that amount. And God responded harshly. Listen, here's the next thing I wrote in my notes. To be sincere in our giving means to give with the right motives. To be sincere in our giving means that you and I give with the right motives. We don't give because we've been pressured. We don't give because we've been coerced. We don't give because we've been manipulated. We certainly should not give for recognition or adulation. We give what? We give out of the sincerity of our hearts. God loved us and God gave. So out of love, out of gratitude, we what? We give back to him and we give back to others. Here's what um, the Lord says. You and I should give sincerely. He, He says a second thing in the passage. He says you and I should give secretly. Not only should we give sincerely, but we should give secretly. Here's what he says. Don't blow a trumpet. Now, let's be honest with the text. There's no historical evidence or any archaeological evidence that large givers actually came to church with large trump or trumpet players. Can you imagine somebody walking into church and there's trumpet players ahead of them and they have their checkbook out and they're strolling in and, and there's people trumpeting in front of them. There, the, there's no evidence historically or archaeologically that that took place. But Jesus is saying that there were individuals that intentionally tried to draw attention to themselves as they gave. When they gave, they wanted other people to know not just that they were giving, but they wanted other people to know that they were giving a large amount. So in response to that, Jesus says in verse 3, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now what in the world does that mean? (laughs) What Jesus uses a proverbial expression, no expectation, no expectation of any recognition whatsoever. The phrase, man, don't let your left hand know what your right hand uh, is doing, meant that, that, that I encountered somebody who had a need. And I felt compelled at that moment to meet the need of that person. And when I gave them a few bucks or when I gave them a check, I gave that to them with a sincere heart, not expecting anything in return, not expecting them to return the money, not expecting them to tell everybody what I, what I did. I did it in a way that I don't want anyone to know. My left hand doesn't know what my right hand is doing Here's what Jesus says. You and I should give not to be praised by others, but you and I give for the purpose of being rewarded by God. That's why we give. Our giving should be between us and God. I'll be honest, be quite frank, I don't know what anybody gives in the congregation. You might give large amounts of money to our church. You might give small amounts of money to our church. I don't have any idea why. Because it's between you and God. And I don't want anybody to give to impress the pastor or to impress anybody else. I want you to give because the Holy Spirit of God has worked on your heart and you want to be involved in the work of God. God has changed you and you want to use the resources that God has given you, not just for yourself, but to change the lives of others as well. So Jesus says this, you and I should give sincerely. You and I should give secretly. But but there's a third thing that I think is inerrant in the passage. We not only should give sincerely and and secretly, but we should also give sacrificially. We should give sacrificially. I'm reminded, I'm gonna jump just ahead of the notes just a second, but I'm reminded of the words of David in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 24 when David said this, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. In other words, David realized that God was worthy 
of him um, making a sacrifice. And David didn't want his gift to God to be so insignificant that it cost him nothing. Let me show you another story in the New Testament. Mark chapter 12. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 12? This is, a, this is a fantastic story in a lot of different ways. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. We find Jesus and the disciples are in the temple. They're actually in a part of the temple that was called the court of the women. And, and the idea being that anybody could go in this part of the temple. And it was the part of the temple where the, where the collection boxes were. There were actually 13 different collection boxes that, that they described them being, being formed like a trumpet. I don't know exactly what that means, but they had the form of a trumpet and people would come and, and they would place their collections in the collection box. And so here in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is standing with the disciples in the court of women. Notice, uh, I guess I got to get there. Um, here, right here, Mark, Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums of money. Could you imagine them? They brought their buckets and you know, they had to dump them in, you know, you know, a lot of noise, here goes all the change down in there, and a lot of noise, and all of a sudden the disciples were saying, oh my word, look at how much that guy is giving, and then look how much that guy is giving. People brought large sums of money. Verse 42 says, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Let me tell you, how insignificant this was. Those two copper coins were the equivalent of one 128th of a day's wage. So let's put that in our perspective, okay? Let's just say the average person makes $10 an hour. You might sit back and say, Brian, I hope I made, I wish I made $10 an hour, but let's say the average person makes $10 an hour, $80 a day, all right? One one twenty-eighth of $80 a day, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure plenty of you are gonna do the math right now, is 64 cents. So, so here's these people bringing in large sums of money, and here comes this lady who brings in two small coins, one, one twenty-eighth of a day's wages, and she drops those coins in the offering box. Notice what Jesus says. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. First of all, can you imagine the disciples are going, wait a second, wait, wait, what are you talking about? That one guy, didn't you see the bucket that guy brought in? I mean, what are you saying? She brought in more. Jesus said, no, this lady gave more than anybody else. Verse 44 for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. Jesus said, because she gave all, everything that she had to live on. And that's always such a convicting passage of scripture to me. Let me give you a couple of applications that I drew from that, that God spoke to my heart about this week. First of all, God observes how much we give and how much we keep. Just as as Jesus was observing those that gave, he observes us on our daily basis as he gives to us. He not only observes how much we give, he's not only cognizant of the amount that we give, but he's cognizant of the amount that we keep for ourselves. Because he said, man, those people gave out of unbelievable abundance. They gave large amounts, but it didn't cost them anything. How would he know that? He's sovereign. He's omniscient. He knew not only how much they gave, but Jesus knew how much they kept back for themselves. That's why he said, this woman gave everything she had. He knew how much she had left after she gave. So here's the second thing I wrote down. Generosity then is measured not by the size of the gift, 
but by its size in comparison to what is kept. Can you allow that to sink in for just a second? Generosity is not measured by the size of the gift, but it's measured by its size in comparison to what is kept. Jesus not only notices how much we give to others, how much we give to the work of God, but Jesus notices how much do we keep back for ourselves. Listen, church, let me, one more thing, all right? I know this might be just a little bit convicting. I might be stepping on my toes and a lot of toes, but, but, but here's what I believe Jesus is saying. Generosity should not be a reflection of our budget. Generosity should be a demonstration of our faith. Generosity is not a reflection of our budget, whether we can afford it, whether we can't afford it, you know, we're spending for all of this. Generosity is a demonstration of our faith. Let me pause for a second. I want to put this in biblical context, all right? I want everybody to understand what I'm saying and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We do not give out of obligation. You know, you know in the Old Testament, you know how you gave? You, they had temple taxes that they had to give, And so there were certain times a year that there were certain amounts that they had to give. It wasn't like they gave voluntarily like we do today. There, There were temple taxes that they gave. They gave out of obligation. It started with the Old Testament tithe, and then there were temple taxes that they gave. And they gave because they were commanded to do so. They gave out of obligation to the Old Testament law. Listen, You and I today don't give out of obligation. We're not under the Old Testament law. We might sit back and say, whew, I don't need to give then. We don't give out of obligation. We give out of gratitude. We give out of gratitude for everything that God has done for us. Our giving is not mandated by the law. Our giving is motivated by grace. To think with me today, we love him, not because we're commanded to love him. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. And we give to God. And we give to God's work, why? Because he first gave to us. So, so when we give, we're what? We're just demonstrating that which we have received from God. We are emula- emulating the actions of our Father. He loves us so much that he gives. You see, the gospel compels us to be generous. The gospel compels us to see the needs of others as greater than our needs. The gospel compels us to give for the benefit of others. The gospel compels us to be like Jesus. The gospel compels us to give like Jesus. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. And someone has said that you can love without, or excuse me, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Why is that? Love compels us to give. Why is Church, we have been given so very much. And I'm afraid if I can be, uh, I love our country, I love our freedom, I love everyone that is given so that you and I can celebrate what we're celebrating this weekend, but we are spoiled. We're spoiled. And we, for some reason, egotistically think that God has blessed us and God has given us so much because we deserve it. And that's why God gives it to us. What if, what if God blessed us for the purpose of being a blessing to the nations of the world? What if God blessed the Burkholder family 
and God blessed your family, and he's given me grace. He's given me forgiveness that I could never, ever deserve. He's given me abundance far more than the world could ever experience. We live in the top one or two percent of the incomes. What if God gave that to me as a demonstration of his love? Not so I could take it and spend it upon myself, but so that I can use it to be a blessing to others. Listen, I'm not saying go sell your house today and bring all your money and lay it at Brian's feet. If you want to do that, God bless you. That's not what I'm asking. (laughs) That's not what I'm asking you to do. Jesus says this, when you give, when you realize how God has blessed you, you give. Give from a sincere heart. Give in secret and give sacrificially to the work of God. You see, quite frankly, at Hollywood Community Church and the churches all around South Florida, there there are more than enough funds for us to turn the city upside down for Jesus Christ. There are more than enough funds for us to to, to, to feed the hungry in Haiti, for us to, to send missionaries. There is more than enough. God has blessed us. But it's gonna take us as people to sit back and say, okay, God, here's why you've blessed me. And God, to the best of our ability, being led by the Holy Spirit of God, I wanna take what you have given me and I wanna give it back to you because you, are worthy. How does God view your giving this morning? I'm not asking you how Brian views your giving, how the elders view your giving. How does God view your giving? Allow God to speak to your heart. Is your giving a demonstration of your budget or is your giving a demonstration of faith? I'm not asking you to do anything crazy, but I'm asking you at times to trust God. Such a unique thing to step out by faith and say, God, you know what? I I want to do this, and I am going to trust you. And it's amazing when God opens the windows of heaven. Doesn't make us wealthy, but he supplies our needs. We take that verse, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, we quote it all the time. But my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we cut it out of its context. In its context, Paul is commending the Philippians. He said, you continually gave to the work of God as I took the gospel around the world. You were sacrificial in your giving. As a result of that, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I believe this. I haven't fully embraced it yet, but I believe that I cannot outgive God. And I, can't, I believe you cannot outgive God. God blesses those who give sincerely who give secretly, and who give sacrificially.